Australia's Great Barrier Reef stretches almost 1,500 miles. It's the world's largest reef system and one of the most complex environments on our planet. The rhythms of life oscillate from breathless heat to violent storms. At this time of year, hurricanes brew off the coast, ready to wreak havoc on both reef and rainforest. The Category 5 pipeline had unleashed its fury on North Queensland. But new forces are also intensifying. They're fishing uh, within a green zone, which is an offence. It's about protecting the Great Barrier Reef. How will the reef respond to the threats that challenge its delicate balance? It's summer in North Queensland, but not as you know it. The locals call it the wet season. It's a time when the tropics heave with energy. The rain falls hard. River runoff and ocean currents are pumping nutrients into this supercharged ecosystem. The base of the food chain is primed. Huge schools of bait fish now gather to feed on plankton at junctions of current. Predators from all over the Pacific Ocean converge on the reef to take advantage of this time of plenty. A school of sailfish will take this one. Working together, the hunters move to control the bait fish. In the battle between predator and prey, both have developed extraordinary adaptations. The bait fish move in tightly coordinated schools to dazzle the predators. The sailfish have evolved long bills to slash through the bait balls and pick off the engine. As they push the bait ball to the surface, eyes in the sky are waiting. Seabirds stuff their gullets with enough fish for themselves and their chicks. By January, colonies are full of anxious parents, hoping their young will fledge before the weather gets too wild. But so far, no storm, and the temperature is soaring. On remote Rain Island, researchers are battling 105 degree heat and blistering sun. They're here to check the nesting on one of the most protected island sanctuaries in the world. <laughs> Up the top, all the way to the top. Let's do it. Yeah. So Warwick, if you want to add another 43 Rufus night herons. Okay, Mark. Geez, there is a lot of frigacy out there, isn't There's it? A lot of frigacy. It's... I had a cut in this basin of 200. What we have noticed is that some of the seabirds on Rain Island have undergone some pretty significant declines. Nearly all the seabirds that we see here rely on the ocean for food, so they're feeding on fishes like you know sardines and, and herring, the sort of schooling fish. And what we think is happening is that because of overfishing of the predators of some of these schooling fish. There's not the big fish around now to 
push those bait balls to the surface. And that means that these sorts of birds can't access them as easily. So in some years, um, they do very, very poorly because there's just not the food for them. We need to be very mindful of the fact that human beings aren't the only animals that rely upon the fish for protein. These populations will collapse if they can't get adequate resources. With a belly full of food, a booby returns from a day's fishing on the reef. Close to shore, a frigate bird is watching. He's the biggest species here, but he doesn't always fish for his food. He prefers to steal it. She tries to dodge the aerial pirate. But her evasive moves are no match for the frigate's speed and power. is to regurgitate mid-flight, saving her life by giving her lunch to the island bullies. <laughs> Yet even then, the battle isn't over. The frigates now fight amongst themselves for scraps of booby vomit. It's a scene that plays out every afternoon as the boobies run the gauntlet to their nests. A broken wing means this booby's fishing days are over. As the sun sets, a rare mirage appears, a green flash on the horizon. It only lasts a second or two. Phantom colours that are hidden unless you know where and how to look. Out in the coral sea, dive instructor Paddy Colwell is about to try just that. He's looking at the submarine world in a whole new light. You're like absolutely ridiculous there, uh, Paddy. With the help of underwater cinematographer John Shaw, he's going to dive using blue lights to try and see the reef from a fish's perspective. Oh, gee. <laughs> Give me a blinding anyway. The blind's pretty good. <laughs> surreal it feels like it shouldn't be like this there's a whole other world within the world that I see out there looking through yellow goggles UV light reveals a world only fish can appreciate taking us deeper into this secret realm Many of the animals on the reef emit vivid fluorescent colours beyond our visual range. As we shine a UV light on this world, we see not only hidden colours, but also hidden creatures. 
And I saw a whole coral full of microscopic little crabs running around the place. And I then decided to lift the filter off my mask. And I put normal light on and I couldn't see them. They weren't there. I look with the blue light again and there they were. There was hundreds of them and they were all over the place. Which means that some animals out there only see these guys and they don't see what I see. Many corals glow and may use the fluorescent light to feed algae within their cells. Others have bright colours around their mouth and tentacles and may use this to attract prey. It was just phenomenal to see how many animals emit a glow you can't see with our red vision. And that to me is nuts. The reef is even nuttier than I thought it was. say before we understand the Great Barrier Reef properly we'll completely understand the human brain which is a nice way of saying it's just too much out there to ever understand it. On the surface here we're brought up thinking we're so important I and mean, we're next step into being God but down there you realise how insignificant you feel. This aquatic universe has given the creatures of the reef some serious artistic license. You need great imagination to even contemplate the strange lives they lead. kind of luminosity. The distant fireworks of late summer announce a change is on the way. A tropical storm is brewing, fueled by the violent clash of wet monsoonal air and the warm tropical sea. But this is no ordinary storm. It's the omen of a cyclone over a thousand miles away. Tonight, the Solomon Islands are facing devastation and despair as the worst flooding in history claims the lives of over 20 people and leaves thousands homeless in the capital Honiara and villages across Guadalcanal province. The storm is now building in intensity and heading for the Australian coast. Now officially named Cyclone Ida, seabirds head north to avoid the storm. Sharks, sensing the drop in barometric pressure, also head for deeper water. Lobsters scurry to find a bolt hole. Cyclones, or hurricanes as they're known in the Northern Hemisphere, form when the ocean surface temperature is over 78 degrees Fahrenheit. The ocean where Cyclone Ida's building is over 82 degrees Fahrenheit. The energy in the system is now equivalent to a 10 megaton nuclear bomb exploding every 20 minutes. Far North Queensland is on alert as tropical cyclone Ita continues to gather strength in the Coral Sea. It's For the residents of Cooktown, it's time to brace. Cooktown is the biggest community in the danger zone and locals have been warned. In eight hours, Cyclone Ida could make a direct hit. What can I do? Go a big hit like this, like monster. I'm scared very, very much. You're expecting a bit of a breeze. 
Category 5, breeze. <laughs> Category 5 is the highest possible cyclone rating. Now is the calm before the storm. For generations, sailors here have sought refuge from cyclones in the mangroves. Their narrow creeks and thick foliage provide protection from wind, waves and storm surge. For local resident Oscar Oberhauser, it's a last resort. No anchor or mooring will survive the full brunt of a cyclone. I live on the mountain, I built it, take this away and um, that's it. That's all I've got. Okay, behind you, behind you. Oh, right. Here. Oscar can only hope the mangroves will save his home. But he's not the only one preparing for the worst. Further inland, the animals of the rainforest also sense the approaching storm. The rapid drop in air pressure signals a catastrophe is looming. Satellites show Cyclone Ida is affecting an area of over 300 miles across. Wind gusts at its core are clocked at 190 miles per hour. People in Cooktown are preparing for the worst. One more, Chris. Don't be out in the wind, half right, it belongs now. Treat all power lines as live. That's a really important message. It's an old town cooked down. It was established in the gold rush days, so there's concern about um, some of the iconic old buildings around town. What's coming through now is a high <laughs> intensity category five. If we get it in direct hit, this place has never had anything like that. It, it really is, um, you know, we're in uncharted waters. For many locals, the only option is to move into the reinforced town cyclone shelter. We haven't had one since 1949, and it's a huge one. Winds are now gusting at over 75 miles per hour. At 9 p.m., Cyclone Ida makes landfall. The wind tears through town. Residents emerge to see how much of the town is left standing. Fortunately, Cyclone Ida had lost some of her fury by the time she reached Cooktown. It's not as devastating as it could have been. But there's still a trail of destruction. Unbelievable. Used to be a beautiful tree, this. I love me trees. Yeah, okay. The wind was howling and the trees were cracking and it was just 
whoosh over the top of us all the time. Then the iron from the big pub across the road was banging across the fences and yeah, it was really scary. The West Coast pub stands in splinters. The roof peeled off like a tin can. This man's got the Italian restaurant across the road and uh, in, in some ways we're, we're competitors, but uh, he's the first man over here, so yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. That's the way it should be in a town like yeah, this, yeah. uh, which is good. Yeah. In the harbour, Oscar's making the nervous journey to see if the mangroves have kept his boat safe through the night. It's a sad sight, isn't it? <laughs> All right, eh? <laughs> this is stuff. All right, not bad. Uh, they're marvellous things, these mangroves, aren't they? You, you, you cannot believe just how effective they are against strong wind. Astonishing. His boat is battered, but still afloat. The mangroves have cradled her through the storm and prevented large areas of coastline from severe erosion. Oscar was lucky but the reef out near Lizard Island bore the full brunt of the storm, recording wind speeds around 130 miles an hour. A team from the Catlin Seaview Project had come to survey the damage. Using a 360 degree camera, they've been gathering baseline information on the health of the Great Barrier Reef. It just so happens, they surveyed this exact area about a year ago. This is how it looked before the storm. A giant clam living in dense coral. And here it is today. The devastation on the most exposed reefs is gut-wrenching. Bombies have been rolled over the bottom like wrecking balls. Branching corals reduced to piles of rubble. Over the last decade, destructive storms have accounted for about 48% of the decline in coral cover. Climate scientists forecast that with rising global temperatures, the intensity of storms will increase. In 24 hours, Cyclone Ida has dumped 16 inches of rain across far north Queensland. Waterfalls now thunder through the rainforest. As rivers spill out onto the inner reef, plumes of sediment cloud the water. Just off Cardwell, commercial fisherman Glenn Murray and his son Ben are on the hunt for threadfin salmon. But the silt plume from the cyclone is making it a lean day on the water. Not real good so far, but anyway, we'll keep on trying. <laughs> That's fishing. If you caught them all the time, it would be called catching. Glenn and Ben are connected deeply to the health of the reef. If they don't catch, they don't eat. Just to be 40, so he's good. He's probably about $4 worth, so yeah. So all we need is another couple of those, and we've paid for the fuel so far today, so. Oh, well. Oh, don't worry, mate. You get uh, a fifth of the catch, 20%, so you might have made a dollar out of that today. Yeah, you're all right. Good day. Good day. Oh, well, maybe we'll do better luck with the crab. 
Let's grab that one, Ben. See what we've got. Take the good with the bad. When the crabs are together, they uh, do fight. So we'll just get her out of there. She's throwing a nipper off there as her defence mechanism. And that allows them to swim away or run away. And whatever they've locked onto then has to fight to try and get that nipper off. You cannot actually prise that apart. Don't get it on your finger. Very, very, very painful. Glenn is one of around 1,500 licensed commercial fishermen operating in the waters of the Great Barrier Reef. Grassroots industries that are important to many local communities up and down the coast. We're here for the long haul. My son, he's only 20 years of age, so hopefully he'll be still able to come out and do this commercial fishing when he's 50 like I am. We've got to look after the environment itself there because the fish rely on it and so do we. The difficult balancing act of commerce and conservation plays out across 1,500 miles of coastline. Fishing is an important industry on the reef, but rules are in place to ensure the fishing is done sustainably. Six AM somewhere on Cape York. The authorities have received intel. There's someone operating illegally nearby. One of our targets wasn't where we're supposed to be. Uh, the plan is we're going to take the uh, the vessel down. Let's go. These teams are responsible for policing the rivers, oceans, beaches, and islands of the entire reef. It's no easy task. A helicopter run like this, we would do anywhere between seven and eight hours a day. Um, averaging around 160 k's an hour, you can imagine how far that is. 500, 800 k's, probably 1,000 k's a day at times. Some of the fisheries in this area, uh, you've got commercial netting, commercial crabbing. Offshore, you've got mackerel fishing, line fishing cray fishing, there's trawlers, coral collectors, fish collectors. So there's all those fisheries operating inshore and also offshore in this area. We often use a bit of stealth, uh, knowing that there's a target of interest in the area. And well, we, we can use the wind, we can have the sun, uh, different angles, come down from high up in the sky. It's quite easy to surprise people. Looks like he's okay, mate, he's outside the green zone. The entire marine park is divided into a patchwork of conservation zones, ranging from places where anyone can fish through to strict no-take areas. The chopper crew has just spotted a vessel fishing in a restricted area. Hey, mate, I'm quite sure there'd be a boat and a green up there. Yeah, according to my iPad, to that target over there, yeah, there's right a very now. good chance it'd be in a green zone. Yep, no worries. The boat's details are recorded, and a hefty fine will soon follow. You can see people with uh, hand lines, fishing lines in the water. Yeah, it most definitely appears that they're fishing uh, within a green zone, which is an offence. Last year, a commercial fisherman was fined $50,000 for offences. But as the evidence tapes show, that deterrent is sometimes not enough. So you can see them throwing things over the side, scurrying around quickly taking the cowling off the motor, making out they've broken down. As soon as they tried to hide their faces and put a bucket over their head. There's a whole range of different behaviours that you see and it is quite funny. All right, you just threw a fish out of the wood. No, I'm just trying <laughs> to get the red jack. The authorities make up to 50 prosecutions a year and issue over 180 warnings. No 
Always taking fish from the green zone are taking our fish. It's a communal asset. It's about protecting dugong, looking at turtle, even looking at crocodile. It's about protecting the Great Barrier Reef. We always say that uh, it's not if but when. We've got time and we've got dedication and we always get them in the end. Rain Island, on the outer edge of the reef, is a place so protected, only a few scientists have permission to land here each year. As the world's largest and most important breeding ground for green sea turtles, its conservation is critical. Morning. In recent years, rising sea levels have been causing high tides to flood turtle nests with catastrophic results. Researcher Andy Dunstan is here to see what can be done to protect the rookery. This is measuring uh, the height of the water table. As the tide comes up, the water seeps through the sand. If it inundates the nests for probably more than 30 minutes for over a three day period, then the eggs are gonna die. We should see each night, 400,000 hatchlings making the water. From what we've seen in the last few years, that would be highly unlikely. Andy is working with Marine Park scientist Mark Reed to understand how serious the problem is. One of the things that draws people to studying sea turtles is just how difficult it is for them as a species to make their way in the world. You know, they've been around for a couple hundred million years, but at every stage in their lives, it's, it's a hard-won battle. And that really highlights just why it's so important to understand how Rain Island is, is functioning as a rookery. And if it's not functioning properly, what we can do to make a difference. By digging a trench along the shoreline, hatchlings will be caught and counted as they leave the beach. It'll be a long afternoon and an even longer night ahead. It's April, and nearing the end of the hatching season. Two hours after the sun sets, the cooling sand triggers the emergence of thousands of hatchlings. They begin their frantic race to the water's edge. But the trench, isn't the only obstacle they'll face tonight. Ghost crabs also haunt the beach. escapees make a final push. Right, wow, well, this is um, turning out to be quite a big hatchling night. Well, we're counting a 50 metre sector of where we did our nesting success counts earlier in the year. Well, that's 55 in my little bag for journal. I'm going to take these down and let them go at the other end of the trench back into the water. In many ways, the little hatchlings are just like little wind-up toys. You let them go and they keep on scurrying. It's that amazing 
burst of energy, the first sort of 24 hours of just going for it, trying to get away from this island that really enhances their chances of survival. That's another 122 hatchlings in the last five minutes. So it does look like a lot, but that's only one nest. On the beach here, the babies face predation by crabs and birds. And once they make the water, there are thousands of other predators that await them. The key to survival is getting away from the reef under cover of darkness and out into the deep ocean. Come dawn, hatching is stopped. Predators make the daytime journey too risky. While it appeared to be a busy night, the numbers were well below expected. Mark now has the gruesome job of counting the turtles that didn't make it. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to get a measure of how many hatchlings have actually successfully emerged from the, the eggs. And of those eggs that remain out of this clutch, I'm then opening them up to see whether or not we've got some that have almost fully developed before they died and then we've got these over here that have barely started developing before they then stopped only five percent of eggs are currently producing hatchlings and of those it's estimated that only one in 1000 will survive to adulthood all of the data indicates that this place isn't functioning particularly well as a turtle rookery and that's a really bleak picture for the world's largest aggregation of nesting green turtles. With rising sea levels flooding the nests, Mark and Andy believe that the only way to help secure the rookery is to raise the height of the sand. If the nesting area is made high and dry, it could turn the tide for this endangered species. is about improving the chances for success. Rather than leaving this little guy on the beach in the heat of the day and also exposed to the predators, we'll just take him down and, and give him a, at least a fighting chance of swimming out there into the ocean and becoming part of the next generation. Chances of it actually becoming an adult are very, very slim indeed. But part of the whole story of the reef and pretty much what everybody is doing is just to improve the fighting chance of the whole ecosystem. So whilst it might seem a, a trivial thing for us to take one individual hatchling down and, and let it go, um, just to improve its chances, every little bit counts. He's just going across the reef flat now, so he's running the first gauntlet of many. The hatchlings now leave Rain Island to drift on Pacific Ocean currents. It'll be about 10 years before they see land again, and around 30 years before they come back to Rain Island to nest. What they find when they return will depend on what humans have chosen to value and protect. Another year. The year has come full circle 
Winter is back, and dive operator John Romney is heading out for an extraordinary trip. We live for this. I never get tired of going out to sea. This whole sense of freedom and adventure, and you just don't know what's going to happen next. Every July for the last 20 years, he has ferried tourists and scientists out to the ribbon reefs in search of deep sea giants. We don't see them every day. We end up having them every trip. So you, you definitely have to look. We have all the guests stationed around the boat. This strange sound signals an approach. Out of the blue, the Leviathan appears. Only discovered here a little over 30 years ago, these dwarf minky whales have travelled over 4,000 miles from the Southern Ocean to be here. These dwarf minkies still tower next to the floating tourists. about here on the Barrier Reef with these dwarf Mickey Wells is that they seek us out, they come to us. But it's just this privilege of sharing a moment and they're recognizing you, you're recognizing them, and being eye to eye with a seven meter animal that wants to visit you is, is just um, unbelievable. John was one of the first tour operators to actively support science by bringing research and tourism together. The trips are funded by tourists, and the data being collected on board is giving us a window into their world. It turns out that most of the whales that visit the tourists are teenagers, possibly doing something a little naughty. The adults appear to be more cautious, only rarely visiting the tourist vessels. Here they're protected, but outside of the warm, safe waters of the Great Barrier Reef, they can be targeted by whalers in the Antarctic. This is just the biggest friendly animal in the world. Everyone that comes, they leave as reef and whale ambassadors, and we need more people to care in order to uh, protect what we love. Minky's presence is a reminder of the true value of the Great Barrier Reef. Its function extends far beyond these waters. Its worth is one for all the ocean. It's a wild space of global importance, where vast rivers meet ocean currents, where animals, plants and people link the land and sea together. Given its scale, it's easy to think the Great Barrier Reef is independent of the forces that surround it. But in nature, nothing exists on its own.